Christine mentioned that our first speaker today is Rachel Skinner, who I'm very proud to call a colleague here at WSP. But, but more importantly, uh, she recently became president of the Institution of Civil Engineers. And uh, maybe some others who are here today uh, joined for her very inspirational and provocative um, opening speech or inaugural address as the new president um, as, she, as she began her, her year in this office and talked about the importance of, of shaping zero, as she puts it, um, and how that ties into infrastructure and, and really asking the question, you know, what are we all going to bring? What are we going to do to help uh, shape zero along with Rachel and ICE? So with that, I give it to Rachel Skinner. Thank you very much, Tom. Fantastic. And, and thank you all for inviting me to, to speak briefly here today. Um, so as you've just heard, um, the, the main reason, I guess, for, for, for joining all of you today is, is to acknowledge and, and formally uh, start the process of, of the Institution of Civil Engineers being a partner of ICSI, which is fantastic, as you just saw on the slide just now. And as you just heard, I stepped up as president of the Institution of Civil Engineers just last week. Um, and my theme for the year happens to be all about net zero carbon for civil engineering and infrastructure. And so it really is a bit of a perfect match, which is fantastic. Um, so I'm just going to speak very briefly about the ICE, the Institution of Civil Engineers. I want to talk a little bit about my choice of presidential theme being shaping zero, net zero carbon. Obviously an absolutely key cornerstone in terms of sustainability and resilience that's of benefit not just to the UN Sustainable Development Goal 13, but also all of the SDGs actually in various ways, shapes and forms. Um, I want to talk a little bit around what the ICE is already doing in this space and perhaps um, I want to float a bit of an idea about something that I think I've learned just in, since last week actually that I think we could all perhaps all do together and I want to talk in particular about where we might share and work closely together over not just the coming weeks and, and year but indeed beyond that. Um, so about the ICE, very briefly for those who aren't all that familiar, um, we have over 95,000 members. Um, headquarters are in the UK, in London, but our reach actually goes far beyond that because roughly 30% of our members, maybe 25 or 30,000 people or so, are based elsewhere in the world. So we have large pockets of, of uh, civil engineering members based in places like Hong Kong and the US, Australia, New Zealand, Malaysia, all over the place. So it's not just a, a British thing. Um, our focus, generally speaking, is to provide uh, a gold standard for civil engineering, um, first by setting the qualification standards for British um, chartered civil engineers, um, but also through creating and curating knowledge and calling for policy change where it's needed and providing a technical home for all of those 95,000 plus members as they develop professionally through their careers. So in terms of my ICE presidential theme and why I chose net zero carbon, um, that particular choice has been brewing for several years. I knew I wanted to do something that was singular, something that was definitely complex and something about which I felt passionate um, and something also where there was the potential to make a significant difference and really have an impact. And in a funny way, this year in 2020, it was kind of made even more perfect because we've had such a strange year and we have perhaps remembered that we are not in control of everything around us, um, but we've also perhaps gained confidence in the fact that we can actually change fast when we need to. We've, we've kind of remembered that perhaps. And I, it almost feels now, it's almost like the perfect storm, isn't it? With, with things that are unfolding in the US right now and, and emerging priorities perhaps around the US uh, rejoining the Paris Agreement and so on, we literally could not have orchestrated this better if we tried, which is, which is pretty exciting, I think. But no, the, the key point for me is that we know that infrastructure is responsible for roughly 70% of the world's carbon emissions. And it depends on which data set you look at and it depends on how you cut the sectors and so on. But broadly speaking, that is roughly the right sort of figure. And that's a mixture of the energy that goes into all of our infrastructure systems. So transport, buildings, water, waste, digital and so on. But it's also to do with the materials that we use and particularly cement and steel. Um, cement I find fascinating and terrifying I think in equal measure because not only does it create, not only does it require energy to produce it but also the process itself <laughs> creates carbon dioxide which you, you kind of think you know if we were if we were sitting down and thinking about that today we might do it slightly differently but there we go. 
Um, so a lot of it is to do with fossil fuels, energy that's needed to create and then run all these different systems, but it is not just an energy problem because we can't go fast enough if we just rely on decarbonizing energy. We need to change the way that we all, as infrastructure professionals, do almost everything across all of our different spaces, and we need to change really fast in order to bring down those impacts as quickly as possible. Because to me, it is unacceptable that we're now in the position we're in. And while it is to some extent unintentional, unintentional because perhaps we weren't particularly well tuned into the issue, we simply can't ignore it now that we've actually seen the problem. But the good news is it is fixable because we do understand these infrastructure systems. And now it is time to get serious and make fast change. And there's a huge opportunity for leadership and change in this space if we actually choose to seize it, which to me is why I'm so excited about this group existing in the first place, because it feels that this might be the sort of group where actually that change might happen. Now, of course, net zero carbon from a UK point of view, and I guess indeed also an international point of view, is also the perfect theme for this year, because when I first planned to be speaking about this theme, in this particular sort of week or so, it would have marked the start of the COP26 conference, um, had it not been delayed by a year. But now the end of my presidency will be marked almost exactly by the COP26 conference, which is, which is fairly handy, I guess. So I guess I'm counting that as perfect timing still, and a good goal to aim at in terms of how we make serious progress over the year ahead so that we genuinely can, can stand alongside others within that COP26 format and make sure that we're able to report that from an infrastructure point of view, we really are on the case and on the way. So in terms of what the ICE is doing and where I think we can contribute to, to ICSI more generally, there are some things we've done already that we're very keen to share. Um, one of the things that we realized a few months ago um, when we first started um, pulling together some of the key people to, to really help uh, think about carbon from an ICE point of view, we realized that we didn't actually have an up-to-date picture in terms of UK-focused carbon emissions as they related to infrastructure. There was some old data, but there wasn't anything that was absolutely up-to-date. And that was relevant because we also know that in the last decade in the UK, we have seen a huge amount of change towards renewable energy sources, in particular uh, wind and solar, and we also know we've seen some improvements in waste systems, which would also have been bringing down carbon, but we didn't have any way of quantifying that. So one of the pieces of research that we've already commissioned um, was to investigate that. And we have discovered that since 2010 and up to the end of 2018, so the full data sets that are currently available, there has been a 23% reduction in carbon emissions that are to do with the UK and related to, related to infrastructure. And that's obviously great news. And it's a method that perhaps could be rolled out more widely. And um, I guess on the one, one hand, you kind of think, well, that, that's great, you know, massive progress. On the other hand, we know that it isn't nearly enough. And we know that we need to halve those carbon emissions again um, within the next decade in order to get anywhere near a net zero pos a position in time for 2050. But one thing that I can say now is that that method is available. The data is available. It's on the ICU website. So if anybody wants to go and have a look at that and understand what we've done and think about whether or not there's a, there's a method that might be brought through elsewhere in the world, that's something that could be done straight away. The, um, the other thing that we've done is that we've launched um, a programme called the Carbon Project, which is something where, again, from an ICE, I guess, technical practice point of view, we realised there were gaps in our knowledge and there were things that nobody knew how to do from a civil engineering point of view, where we thought, if we just do this together, actually we might have a chance at coming up with some methods and some ways of thinking about things that were consistent and actually helped us to go forward quickly. So there are three particular areas that we're looking at at the moment within the ICE's carbon project. The first one is to do with measurement um, because we have a myriad number of different ways of measuring carbon at the moment, certainly in the UK, but there is no general agreement on which is the best method. And if you look at different sectors and different parts of the life cycle, there's different things everywhere. So we are trying to bring some clarity to that. The second area is to do with capabilities, and here there's a really good alignment with one of the ICSI action tracks. Um, we're looking at things to do with skills and codes and standards, trying to work out what good looks like, um, and in particular, where are there new skills, where are there new standards or changes needed in order to make sure that technical practice to do with, with you know, carbon thinking actually does come through as it needs to over the relatively short term. And the third piece is to do with carbon systems thinking for infrastructure and understanding where the carbon impacts are at the moment, where there is the greatest potential for rapid change, where resilience fits in, uh, and just trying to sort of take that, that bigger picture view as well. 
So those are the three areas that we're concentrating on at the moment. Um, we do potentially have the ability to add in other strands as and when they're needed. And the idea is it's very much a task and finish exercise. So it's not sort of creating groups that exist forever for, the, for their own sake. It's very much about, right, this is what we need to do. OK, we've done that. Right now, what's the next thing we need to do? So we are very keen to share on all of those fronts because there is no point, certainly from my point of view, in everybody discovering the same things if actually 80% of it is useful to everybody and, and can just be adjusted and adapted to be used in different contexts. Um, but there's one other thought, as I mentioned at the beginning, that I just want to, I suppose, float in the context of today and something that I, I think I've learned um, over the course of just the last week. And it's maybe another action that we might think about taking forward all, all together, I guess, because I think perhaps we need to take it back a step. One of the things that I did in my presidential address uh, last week is I, I took the time to really explain, or I've tried to explain at least, some of the core concepts that sit behind um, the carbon thinking, I suppose, climate change thinking and so on. Because it really has been bothering me that we have a whole load of people, especially those in really quite influential positions, who they say they get it, they use all the right words, but it's becoming increasingly obvious that they don't really understand what those concepts mean. They don't understand the distinction between them. And unless you are at the moment in a fairly sort of specialist or niche role, it may well be that you can get away with faking it and nobody actually realizes that you don't know what you're talking about. Um, so I think there are three key concepts that we could work on explaining far better and, and, and really taking them into the mainstream. Because while we all know how urgent it is to take action on climate change. And while we all know there's no time to waste, and we also probably all know that not everybody gets it, we just don't have time for everybody to go through a kind of a gradual waking up process and, and, and somehow get there. Because actually in the meantime, it's really dangerous, I think, that we have lots of people in influential positions, like I say, who are speaking and making decisions on carbon and on climate change without that understanding. So I think there are, there are three concepts where we need to do a lot more work. Uh, the first one is the concept of net zero carbon itself, because I think they're very easy words to say, and I don't think everybody understands what they really mean. Yeah, for those who are interested, you can look back at the film that we launched last week. I, I used the bath analogy. It wasn't mine. It's something I found useful to explain it to others. But this idea that you've got a tap, which is where the emissions are coming from. You've got a drain at the bottom of the bath, which is the ability of, if you like, the planet to cope or the bath to cope with that level of, of emissions, like the level of water, you know, the amount of water coming in through the tap. And the point about net zero carbon is that the bath water is not rising. But at the moment, I don't think people understand just how fast we're filling up that bath. They do not understand the, the imbalance between the level of emissions we're producing and the inability of our planet to cope with those emissions. So I think, I think there's a lot of work to do to really just get that absolutely fundamental concept sorted out in people's minds. And then I think the, other, the second and the third pieces are to do with climate mitigation, the absolute need to cut carbon to make those reductions. And the, and the piece, the climate, so that beyond that climate mitigation piece, then the, the third piece, if you like, is around climate adaptation and the difference between adaptation, so coping, and the mitigation piece, which is actually taking the action to do the reduction of the carbon itself. If we can get those three things clear in people's minds, it feels to me that we have a much better shot at actually working together towards achieve, achieving something. And it feels at the moment that we are very, very far from that understanding. And I've had so much feedback on that in just the last week or so, where people are just saying, ah, oh, at last, I actually understand I've been using the wrong word, or I actually understand that, you know, I need to think about this differently, or I realise now I've only been thinking about one piece of this, and I should have been thinking about more than that. So I, I guess it's just a thought, really, in terms of an area that we might want to, we might want to consider before we just charge off and start doing lots and lots of detailed technical work. Because if we haven't got those core concepts sorted out in people's minds, the chances of us actually landing any real progress perhaps will be limited. But coming back to today and, and things that I think we, we can all do to help, it, it strikes me that all of these climate-led topics apply everywhere across the world. And of course, these carbon emissions don't respect boundaries. So actually what we all do matters, but what others do matters too. <laughs> and it's a, really, it's a really complicated problem in that respect. But it strikes me that ICSI could absolutely act as an umbrella to make sure people do understand those core concepts and to help to uncover the world's best examples around some of the biggest carbon, climate, resilience questions that are out there. Create a forum for, perhaps for more sharing 
um, and, to, and to make sure that where there are exemplars, we really are doing something about it, whether it's to do with the, the cutting carbon bit, the mitigation fees, the turning down of the tap. Perhaps it's to do with finding examples where that actually costs less than the usual infrastructure solutions if we can. Perhaps it's to do with putting in place adaptation measures. Obviously, those will be context driven, but can we do those in line with the carbon reduction principles as well so we don't create an even bigger problem to solve? There's, there's so many different things we could be thinking about in terms of how we actually showcase the really great stuff that's going on. So all sorts of ideas there, but, but in closing, I am genuinely delighted, as I hope comes across both, both personally and professionally, that the ICE is now able to become a partner of ICSI because I do think that it's only through collaboration that we can possibly go fast enough to address the climate crisis that is unfolding around all of us and which only becomes more and more urgent with every passing day. So we are really keen to be actively involved. And in fact, as you'll hear later on in this, in this discussion, um, we are in fact uh, co-leading on one of the action tracks through Mark Hansford. Um, and we're also really keen to build links beyond that. So Seth Schultz, who I think is dialed in, here's someone on, in, inside this event, is our ICE Brunel lecturer for the year ahead. So he and I will be kicking off his international lecture tour uh, in a few short weeks time, unfortunately from the comfort of our own desks and kitchens and so on, but never mind. Uh, but from early December and through, through into next year. So it really does feel that we're standing at the gateway here of an initiative that could really deliver significant change for the long run. So really exciting from my point of view. So thank you, Tom. I'll hand back to you at that point, but thanks very much for the, for the time today.